Hi everyone, welcome back to the uh, webinar. Uh, we are very pleased to have Robert Young from NYU and he's speaking on metric differentiation and Lipschitz embedding in LP spaces. Robert? Thanks. Okay, so uh, the slides are online at this address here. Um, and uh, yeah, feel free, to ask, feel free to ask me any questions if you have any questions. So um, today I want to talk about Lipschitz maps from metric spaces to Banach spaces and how we can analyze these maps using ideas about differentiability. So the classical example is Rademacher's theorem. I mean, Rademacher's theorem tells you that if you have a Lipschitz map uh, from R to R, then it's differentiable almost everywhere. Another way to say that would be to say that there are infinitely many intervals in the domain where that function is arbitrarily close to a linear map. Uh, and so what I want to do today is I want to explain how to use versions of this idea, versions of Rademacher's theorem to analyze maps from other metric spaces into other Banach spaces. Uh, and in particular, I want to talk about an example I came up with with the soft knower uh, that shows that there's no nonlinear version of a particular theorem of Kadatz and Pelczynski. So let me start with this, with, with, with this theorem. So Kadatz and Pelczynski proved that if you have two exponents, p and q, um, and p is less than q, and they're both greater than or equal to one, less than infinity. Um, if you have a Banach space, which is isomorphic to a subspace of LP and a subspace of LQ, then for any exponent between p and q, uh, x is isomorphic to a subspace of L sub r. And so this is a sort of interpolation result. If you're a subspace of two LP spaces, then you're a subspace of anything in between. Um, and this is a this is a this is this is a result about the linear theory of Banach spaces. This deals with linear subspaces and linear isomorphisms. And there's a long history of trying to take results in the linear theory of Banach spaces and try to generalize or at least translate them to nonlinear theory uh, to look at metric subsets and Lipschitz maps. So can we do that here? So let's let, let's define. Uh, a map f from x to y is a bilipschitz embedding if there's some c greater than zero, so that if you take any two points in the domain, uh, then the distance between the image of those two points is within a factor of c of the distance between those two original points. The distance f of x and f of y is between c times the distance between x and y and c inverse times the distance between x and y. Um, and so we can ask, okay, if I have a metric space that embeds in LP and embeds in LQ, does it necessarily embed in everything in between? But it turns out that the answer is no. Uh, Asaf and I showed that there's a metric space X, uh, which bilatrix embeds into L4 and into L1, but not into LP for any P between one and four. And so what I want to do today is I want to try to, is I want to tell, to tell you about this example and about the, 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 the why it embeds in L1 and L4, but not in L2. Okay. So this example is based on the Heisenberg group. Uh, and so the, the, the fact that this embeds in L1 and L4, but not in L2, is based on a geometric result about the Heisenberg group. Uh, so let me state this result. Um, let M be a metric, so, so I, need, I need one definition, which is that if M is a metric space, uh, X is a Banach space, we say that a map F from M to X is a Bilipschitz embedding with distortion D. Uh, if it's a distance decreasing map, I mean, because, we're, we're, because our target is a Banach space, we can always rescale to make our map distance decreasing. Uh, a distance decreasing map that doesn't decrease distances by more than a factor of D. Uh, and then we define the X distortion of M denoted C sub X of M to be the infimal distortion for which such a map exists. And then um, I can use this definition to state a, a theorem about the Heisenberg group. Uh, and I'll describe the Heisenberg group in a bit, but let me just first, first state the theorem. Um, let M sub R be the ball of radius R in the three-dimensional Heisenberg group HZ. Then the L1 distortion of M sub R is on the order of the fourth root of log r. Um, this is due to a couple people. So the, 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 the first result in this direction uh, was a lower bound by Cheeger, Kleiner, and Noor, who showed that um, 
any map from the Heisenberg group to, 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 to L1 has distortion at least poly, poly, polylogarithmic in R, uh, which is to say at least distortion on the order of log R to, uh, I believe they had a power of log R to the 2 to the minus 50th or so. Uh, and then recently, Asaf and I have shown sharp upper and lower bounds on this distortion estimate. Um, where, but, but if, we, if we increase the exponent, if we look at LP instead of L1, uh, we get a discontinuity. Uh, the distortion of M sub R in LP is on the order of log R to the power of one over the maximum of P and two, if P is greater than one. Uh, and so again, this is due to a couple people. Uh, the upper bound is due to embeddings of Aswad and Tessera. Uh, there are lower bounds due by, by there, there, there are lower bounds by Austin, Noor, and Tessera in the case p equals two, and then Laforge and Noor for, for, for arbitrary p. Um, and so what we have, what this theorem tells us is that the distortion of the Heisenberg group, or at least balls of radius r in the Heisenberg group in LP spaces, looks something like this. Uh, so what do we have here? We have we have the uh, we 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 we, 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 we we, we have two cases. Um, embeddings in L1 have distortion on the order of the fourth root of log. Uh, but then when we increase that exponent, uh, when we take p greater than 1, uh, we get a discontinuity at 1. Uh, it's, the distortion is like root log r between 1 and 2. And then it decreases as p increases further, which which is reasonable because we expect that uh, any metric space embeds isometrically in L infinity. And so, 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 so it's not unreasonable that this embedding can, can get better and better as, uh, as, as P increases. Is this, a, is this okay so far? Okay, so what does this have to do with our example? Remember, remember we, we, our, our goal here is to construct a metric space that embeds into L1 and L4, but not into L2. Um, and so the, the, the relevance to our example, or the, 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 the main feature of this graph is that we have this sort of peak here. Uh, the distortion is relatively low. It's fourth root of log in L1. Then when you increase the exponent slightly, it jumps up to root log r. And then when you increase the exponent further, it decreases again. So we have this peak. The most distortion happens between 1 and 2. Um, and so we construct this example that embeds into L1 and L4, but not into L2, by using this peak. Uh, what we can do is we can take uh, the ball of radius r in the Heisenberg group, m sub r. If we distort the metric on that by a factor of the fourth root of log, then we get something that embeds by Lipschitzly in L1. And it turns out that that same distortion, that uh, fourth root of log distortion, is also enough to get it to embed into L4. Um, and so this distorted version of M sub R embeds by Lipschitzly in L1 and L4, but we haven't, we haven't distorted the metric enough for it to embed in L2. Uh, we would need an additional fourth root of log distortion to get it to embed in L2. And so if we can show that the, uh, the, 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 the the distortion exponent follows this pattern. Now, there's this peak in the distortion between L1 and L2. Then that more or less gives us this example. That, 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 that gives us a way to construct something that embeds better in L1 and L4 than in L2. And so what I want to do today is I want to try to explain this curve. I want to try to explain, I guess, roughly three things. I, want to, I, 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 I still need to describe the Heisenberg group H. Um, I want to talk about embeddings of the Heisenberg group in LP spaces uh, for P bigger than 2. I want the, 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 this decreasing slope of the curve. Um, and, and in particular, why these embeddings get better and better as P increases. And I want to talk about um, what Asaf and I have constructed, which is a new way to embed the Heisenberg group into L1 uh, that leads to this, this, this discontinuity at the, uh, this, this, this discontinuity in the graph. Okay, so, so let me start with the Heisenberg group. So the Heisenberg group is a group. It's a three-dimensional no-potent Lie group. Um, it, we, we can write it as a set of three by three upper triangular matrices with ones along the diagonal, and then x, y, and z above the diagonal, where x, y, and z are real numbers. Um, 
And this is a, this, this is a group under a matrix multiplication and it contains a lattice. Uh, if we just restrict, instead of taking x, y, and z to be real numbers, if we take them to be integers, uh, we get a lattice. Um, and that lattice is finitely generated. It's generated by three generators, x, y, and z, uh, where x, y, and z are the upper triangular matrices with a one in one of these positions and then zeros everywhere else. Um, and you can check that if you do the multiplication that the commutator of x and y is equal to z, uh, the commutator of x and z uh, and the commutator of y and z are equal to the identity, uh, so that x and, y, x and z commute and y and z also commute. Um, and so that's basically the, 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 the that's, that's, so that's the group theory of the Heisenberg group. Um, but what we want here is we want a, a, a metric space. We want to put a metric on this group. So how can we do that? Well, the first thing we can do is we can put a metric on the lattice. Uh, so we have this lattice of excuse me, upper triangular matrices with integer coefficients. Uh, and if we draw the Cayley graph, oops, and if we draw the Cayley graph, uh, it looks like this. So this is a graph where you have one vertex uh, for every element of the group. Uh, Elements of the group are determined by three integer coordinates. So, I have, so the vertices here are just the lattice points in R3. Um, and then we connect two vertices. If, if you can get from one element to the other by multiplying by one of the generators. And so you can check, you can do the matrix multiplication and see that if you multiply an element by X, it increases X coordinate by one. If you multiply by Z, it increases the Z coordinate by one. If you multiply by y, it increases the y coordinate by one, and then it increases the z coordinate by the x coordinate. And so what we have is we have these black lines corresponding to z going up and down. We have these red lines corresponding to x going from side to side, and we have these blue lines going back and forth, and the blue lines tilt uh, because what multiplying by y does to the coordinates depends on the x coordinate. Okay. Um, and so. You can see the relations that I mentioned on the previous slide. Uh, so you know that x and z commute because you start at any point and you move x, z, x inverse, z inverse. Um, you come back to where you started. Same thing if you multiply, start at any point and you multiply y, z, y inverse, z inverse, and then you come back to where you started. Uh, and then the commutator of x and y is equal to z which you can see by starting at any point and moving along a spiral, moving x, y, x inverse, y inverse, moves you up by one step in the z direction. So there are a couple things to notice about this graph. One is that we have these spirals. So here's a small spiral here, but we have these spirals of all scales in this graph. Uh, if, I, if I look at x squared, y squared, x to the minus 2, y to the minus 2, that corresponds to moving up by a distance of 4. Uh, if I look at x to the fourth, y to the fourth, x to the minus 4, y to the minus 4, that's equal to z to the 16th. And more generally, um, I can write z to the n squared as a product x to the n, y to the n, x to the minus n, y to the minus n. So we have these spirals occurring at all scales. And one of the reasons that they occur at all scales like that is because they're really they're really scalings of each other. Uh, if I take my if I take that first spiral and I stretch the x coordinate by a factor of two and the y coordinate by a factor of two and the z coordinate by a factor of four, I get this bigger spiral. And in fact, if I take this whole graph and I stretch the x coordinate by a factor of two and the y coordinate by a factor of two and the z coordinate by a factor of four, I get this bigger graph. And you can if, if you look at this carefully, you can see that. This graph is a subset of this graph, that all the, all the edges in this graph occur in this graph, but also you have all these other edges too because it's a much denser graph. Uh, so, you have this, the, 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 so, so, you, so you have this natural scaling of the group corresponding to replacing x by x to the n, y by y to the n, z by z to the n squared. Um, and that has a very strong effect on the geometry. Uh, so, for example, it has a very strong effect on, on the geodesics, on the shortest paths in this graph, um, because 
when the because well basically because these spirals get more and more efficient as they get larger uh, so our first spiral this is a path of length four that moves up by distance one our second spiral this is a path of length eight that moves up by distance four and then this is a path of length 16 that moves up by distance 16. Um, in general, as we increase n, we're going to get our spiral is going to be a path of length 4n uh, that moves up by a distance of n squared. And so when n is large, that spiral is much more efficient than just traveling vertically. The, 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 the easiest way to move up and down in the Heisenberg group is to go around in a spiral. And that has a strong effect on the geodesics because that means that if I take two points in the Heisenberg group that are far apart and I try to connect them by, uh, by a shortest path, that shortest path can't have too many uh, vertical edges, can't have too many of these black edges, uh, because if there are a lot of vertical edges, then you, can, you, 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 you then, then you have a segment of the path which is vertical, and you can replace that segment with a spiral um, to, to make the path shorter. So there's a bound on the number of vertical edges that, that can occur in a geodesic. OK so far? OK. So, this tells us a lot about the, the, the geometry of this graph, but what we really want is we want a metric on the Lie group. We want a metric on the, the, the whole three manifold. Um, and so, what we, so, so one way to get that is to take a scaling limit. Uh, if we, you, you, you can see that we had our original lattice, and then we, 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 we shrank x by 2 and y by 2 and z by 4 to get this, this denser lattice. Uh, if we keep on going with that, if we take our original lattice and we shrink the x-coordinate by n, the y-coordinate by n, the z-coordinate by n squared, we're going to get a sequence of denser and denser lattices. Um, and so we'll get a sequence of, of metrics on denser and denser lattices. And these metrics are going to converge to a metric on uh, the entire R3. So what can we say about that metric? Well, on one hand, because of the way we constructed it, because, of, because we constructed it from these scalings, we expect that metric on R3 to be invariant under the, uh, the, this, this n by n by n squared scaling. Uh, we expect it to be invariant under this n by n by n squared scaling. Um, the other thing we can say about this is that geodesics in this new metric, geodesics in this limit metric, ought to be limits of geodesics in the original lattices. And geodesics in the original lattices, we just said, uh, have to be made up almost entirely of red and blue edges. Of these, so they, they, they can only have a bounded number of vertical edges. So in the limit, those vertical edges are going to shrink to zero. And so in the limit, we expect that geodesics in this limit metric should be entirely uh, made of red and blue edges. They should, they should have no vertical segments at all. Uh, and so what, what, what sort of metric has this property that you have this, this n by n by n squared scaling that you have um, that, 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 that at any point in the metric you only have two directions that you can move, this, this, this red direction, this blue direction? Well, this is what's called a sub-Riemannian metric. So a sub-Riemannian metric is like a Riemannian metric except that um, except that you allow some of, the, some of the vectors in the manifold to have infinite length. Uh, what you have is that at every point in the manifold, you have a plane of what you call horizontal vectors. In this case, our, our horizontal vectors are going to be vectors that are, um, that are in the plane spanned by the red and blue edges. So you can see that we have when x equals zero, these are just, these are just flat planes. And then when x increases, these planes start to tilt as you go from left to right. Um, so you have a you 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 you, 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 you at each point you have a horizontal plane, you have an inner product on that horizontal plane, and then the length of any vector that's not in that horizontal plane is is infinity. Uh, so this gives you a, a way to measure the lengths of not every curve, but at least the curves that are that, that are tangent to, to the horizontal planes. So you say that a curve is a horizontal curve uh, if it is tangent, if, if, if it's tangent to these horizontal planes. Um, you can use the inner product to find the lengths of horizontal curves, and then you define the distance between two points in the manifold to be the, to be the infimal length of a horizontal curve connecting them. 
Um, and so you, you, in order for this to be a metric, you need to know that you can get from any point to any other point by a horizontal curve. But that's actually, that, but that's not too hard. I mean, even though you can only move, uh, if you, 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 even though you can only move in two directions, even though you can only move in the x direction and the y direction, you can move in the z direction by taking one of these spiral curves. So if you want to connect two points, you can just move normally in the x and y directions and then connect them vertically using one of these spirals. Okay. So, so what can we say about this metric? Well, like I said, a lot of the properties from the discrete metric carry over. So for example, we had this nice scaling of the lattice in the Heisenberg group where you scale um, by n by n by n squared. That's going to carry over to the metric on the Lie group. Uh, if you scale by t in the x direction, t in the y direction, and then t squared in the z direction, you can check that this preserves these horizontal planes, that this sends horizontal planes to horizontal planes, and it stretches every horizontal vector by a factor of t. So, so therefore, it's going to preserve, send horizontal curves to horizontal curves, and it's going to scale the metric by a factor of t. Just knowing that scaling tells you a lot about the metric. Uh, so for example, um, if, I look, if I start at the identity and I look at the ball of radius one, that's going to be some open set around the identity. That's going to be some open set around the identity. Let's say it's roughly a one by one by one box. If I then take that ball of radius one and I rescale it by a factor of epsilon, um, then that scales the metric by a factor of epsilon. So it's going to send the ball of radius one to the ball of radius epsilon. And so that means that the ball of radius epsilon is going to be approximately an epsilon by epsilon by epsilon squared box. Uh, these are the, 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 the height is always going to be the square of the, the width and the depth. Um, and similarly, this scaling lets me estimate the, uh, the, 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 the metric. Uh, you, can, you, you can get the estimate that the distance from the identity to the point x, y, z is roughly the norm of the x-coordinate plus the norm of the y-coordinate plus the square root of the norm of the z-coordinate. Is it okay so far? Let me just pause for a sec to see if, this, if, this, if, if, if there are any questions. I think it's all good. You can just go ahead. Okay. Thanks. Okay. So, so one thing, one thing to note about this picture is that this picture is not really geometrically accurate. Um, and what I mean by that, remember that when I, when, I, when I started talking about these metrics, I said that um, these are like Riemannian metrics, except that we're allowing some directions, some vectors to have infinite length. Uh, every, every vector that's not in one of these horizontal planes has infinite length. And so these vertical lines here, these all have infinite length. Uh, and in fact, any curve that's not horizontal, I mean, any curve that's not tangent to these horizontal planes has infinite length. And in fact, we can say something stronger that if I want to cover this line segment by balls of radius epsilon, well, balls of radius epsilon are, have height epsilon squared. So if I want to cover this segment with balls of radius epsilon, it's going to take epsilon to the minus two of those balls. And so each of these vertical line segments really has Hausdorff dimension two. If I wanted to draw this group really geometrically accurately, uh, I would want all these vertical line segments to be, well, fractals, to, to, have, to be fractals with, with Hausdorff dimension two. And, 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 and I can't do that in a picture like this. But it's natural to ask, okay, can you do that at all? Uh, is it possible to get a really accurate picture of the Heisenberg group in Euclidean space? Is it possible to, 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 to find an embedding of the Heisenberg group into Euclidean space that preserves distances? Um, or at least maybe uh, preserves distances up to a constant? And it turns out the answer is no. Uh, there's a theorem of Ponsu and Sens. There's no bi Lipschitz embedding from the Heisenberg group into Euclidean space. Uh, and this is a consequence of a theorem of Ponsu. Uh, that every Lipschitz map from the Heisenberg group to Rn is what's called Ponsu differentiable almost everywhere. 
Um, and what this means, normally when we say that a map is differentiable, a uh, map from RM to RN is differentiable, if, or differentiable at P, if when we zoom in to a small neighborhood around P, uh, the map is approximately linear. Uh, Poinsot differentiable means, mean, 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 means something very similar, uh, except that in this case, our domain is the Heisenberg group. So when we say uh, a map from the Heisenberg group to RN is Poinsot differentiable at P, we mean that if you zoom in sufficiently closely around P, uh, and if you zoom in using the Heisenberg scaling around P, then the map gets closer and closer to not quite a linear map, because linear maps from the Heisenberg group to RN don't quite make sense, but to a homomorphism. Uh, Poinsot differentiable means that on sufficiently small scales, your map is close to a homomorphism. Um, and this is important because, well, the Heisenberg group is non-commutative, but RN is commutative. And so any homomorphism from the Heisenberg group to RN has to send the vertical direction to zero, has to send Z to zero. And therefore, if you have a Lipschitz map from the Heisenberg group to RN, then you can find, because of Poinsot differentiability, you can find some small ball on which that map is close to a homomorphism. That homomorphism collapses the vertical direction. And so your, so your Lipschitz map has to also collapse the vertical direction. Uh, and so it can't be, so, 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 so if you have a Lipschitz map, it has to collapse the vertical direction somewhere. It can't be a bi-Lipschitz map. There's no bi-Lipschitz embedding from the Heisenberg group to RN. Um, we are interested not just in RN, but in, in, in LP spaces. But this same theorem generalizes to LP spaces. Cheeger and Kleiner and Lee and Noor showed that there's no bi-Lipschitz embedding from the Heisenberg group to a Bonnach space with the radon decadent property. So LP spaces for P bigger than one, less than infinity. It's okay so far? Okay, so let me actually, let me actually say a couple of words about how this proof works. Uh, because, the, okay, well, what we want to do eventually is we want to construct maps from the Heisenberg group to LP spaces with low distortion. And so this theorem, the fact that we can't do that, this is exactly what we're going to have to try to avoid when we, when we, want, when we want to start constructing maps uh, to LP spaces. And so I want to say a couple of words about the proof of this theorem so we have a better idea of how we can avoid running into this theorem. So the, we can, one way to view this theorem, one way to view this differentiability is to go back to our pictures of the Heisenberg group. So remember, this is our picture of the Heisenberg group. Um, and we can look at these red and blue lines. So, um, these red lines, these are not exactly parallel uh, because they, 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 they don't stay a constant distance apart. If I, if, if, if the distance from say, if I take this line here and then the line behind it here, then the distance from here to here is one. The distance from here to here is one, two. Uh, the distance from here to here is three and so on and so forth. But the thing is that if I go further and further out, if I go n steps out and then I take one step back, uh, the distance from here to here, well, I'm going to take one step back. That's going to increase my z-coordinate by n. And then I'm gonna, I, I can take a spiral down uh, of length square root m. So these lines here are not quite parallel, but they diverge sublinearly. We have some picture where, where, I have, where, where I have a line like this and a line like this, where if they're distance one apart here, then after n steps, they are distance root n apart, right? Um, so so we have these families of lines that are not quite parallel, but they're close to parallel. And so if I have a Lipschitz map from the Heisenberg group to Rn, then I can consider the restriction of that map to those lines. Uh, the, restrict, the restriction to any of these lines is going to be a Lipschitz map. And by Rademacher's theorem, any Lipschitz map is going to be differentiable almost everywhere. Uh, there are going to be infinitely many intervals in these lines. Uh, where the map is arbitrarily close to a, uh, a linear function. And so by applying a little bit of measure theory, uh, we can do a little bit better than that. Uh, we can find some ball, we can find some point and some ball around that point so that all of the red lines going through that point, let's, let, let, let me draw a picture. So we have, we have, we have some, some ball around that point so that all of the red lines going through that point 
are sent by the map to approximately linear functions in Rn, to approximate lines, to, 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 to curves that are close to lines in Rn. And furthermore, because of this parallelism, because these are, because these lines diverge at a sublinear rate, uh, those lines have to be going in approximately the same direction. So we end up sending all of the red lines in this bowl to approximate parallel lines in Rn. Uh, and we can ask the same thing for the blue lines. We can ask that all of the blue lines it, that, that go through this ball also map to approximately parallel lines in Rn. But then that's a problem because remember, in the Heisenberg group, we have these spirals. Uh, if I go, if I start at a point in this ball and I move along the red line, along the blue line, back along the red line, back along the blue line, I'm going to end up vertically separated from where I started. I'm going to end up above where I started. Um, but if I do the same thing, if I look at the image of this spiral, then I'm starting at some point, I'm moving out along the red line, the blue line, the red line, the blue line, that's an approximate parallelogram because the, this map sends all those red lines, all those blue lines to approximate, approximately parallel lines in Euclidean space. Um, so if I have a ball like this, where all of the red lines map to parallel lines and all the blue lines map to parallel lines, then that ball is going to collapse the vertical direction. It's going to send spirals like this to parallelograms like this. And so it's going to collapse the vertical direction. So this is what we want to avoid. We want to avoid uh, having balls where, we want to have, avoid having balls where the map sends all the red lines and all the blue lines to approximate lines in Rn. Is this okay so far? Okay. So what does that mean? That, that, so so, 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 so if, 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 if this is what we're trying to avoid, um, that means that whenever we have a ball in the Heisenberg group, if, if, that, that means that if we, if we construct a low distortion map from the Heisenberg group to Rn or to, or to, or to LP, uh, then whenever we have a ball in the Heisenberg group, there ought to be some, there, 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 there ought to be some lines in that ball that don't map to lines in Rn. Um, the way that I like to phrase this, I guess I do need the, I do, I do need the pad. Um, the way I like to phrase this is that we're, 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 we, we, we want to send lines in the Heisenberg group to bumpy curves in Rn. We want to send them to curves that never look like lines. Uh, so if I, if, I, if I take a typical curve, if I take a typical smooth curve, there are a lot of balls where this is close to a uh, where, where, where this is close to a line, uh, and so what I want to do is I want to send a line to a bumpy curve. I want to send uh, to, to, to a curve that never looks like uh, that, 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 that never looks like a line. So, for instance, uh, one example of a bumpy curve is uh, well, if I, if I take the Coke snowflake, I take a line and then add peaks to the center, and then peaks on the sides of that, and then peaks on the sides of that, and so on and so forth then this curve is never close to a line. I can never draw a ball uh, where this curve is close to a line. Um, the problem is, well, this is not a, the, 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 the Coke snowflake is not a rectifiable curve. You can't, you can't, you, 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 you can't construct a Lipschitz curve that parameterizes uh, the Coke snowflake. Um, and so, so 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 you, so you so you won't in general uh, you won't be able to construct curves that are as bumpy as that you as you want you won't be able to construct curves that are that are never close to a line anywhere uh, so instead you have to do just the best you can otherwise you, you have to construct curves that are as bumpy as possible and so in order to construct maps from the Heisenberg group into LP spaces that's what we're going to try to do. Um, and so how do you construct um, bumpy curves? How do you construct functions that are not differentiable anywhere? Well, this is, this is, this is Weierstrass. The, the, the Weierstrass function is the standard example of a curve that's, um, the Weierstrass function is, a curve, is an example of curve 
that's not differentiable anywhere. Um, is it, 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 it is it like Zeeman topology? I, I don't know what I don't know what Zeeman topology is. Uh, so 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 if someone else has an answer, then feel free to share. But I I, I don't know what Zeeman topology is. Um, so but but so 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 let's do this. So so so. Right. So, 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 so we want to, so, 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 let, so let's try to construct a low distortion map from the Heisenberg group into LP space, uh, or even just L2, using the, the, the ideas behind the construction of the Weierstrass function. Um, the way the Weierstrass function, or the, the, the way the Weierstrass function works is that you, 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 you construct the Weierstrass function as a sum. You start with, um, you start with, 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 with something that oscillates with frequency one, and then you add something that oscillates with frequency two, and then you add something that oscillates with frequency four and eight and so on and so forth until the sum is something that, 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 that's not close to a line anywhere. That's something that's not differentiable. Um, and we can do the same thing in the Heisenberg group. Uh, the first step is to construct analogs of these functions that oscillate at given frequencies. Uh, so we're gonna pick some row greater than one, some scale, uh, we're going to construct one Lipschitz map from the Heisenberg group to L2 that are bumpy at that scale, at scale rho to the i. Uh, so that means that we're going to ask that these maps have images inside the ball of radius rho to the i, and that they separate points at scale rho to the i. Uh, so if I have two points, q1 and q2, where the distance between them is on the order of rho to the i, um, then the distance between their images should also be on the order of rho to the i. Um, and this is not too hard to construct. Uh, one way to do, you, you can do this with a partition of unity. Uh, you can do this, um, you can do this by taking, uh, if, if, you, if you take the Heisenberg group and you take the quotient of the Heisenberg group by the lattice, uh, then you get a three manifold. Uh, and if you embed that three manifold into L2, then you get a map from the Heisenberg group to this three manifold to L2, which separates points at scale roughly one. If I have two points that are distant, say, one apart, then they don't map to the same point in the quotient. And then their image is going to be two different points in L2. And so, 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 so you get a map that separates points at scale one. And then by rescaling this map, you can get a map that's get re that, that it separates points at arbitrary scale. So these are analogs of our functions like so. And so we get an analog of the Weierstrass function by adding them together. Here, we're, 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 we're limited on how many of these we can add together because we want the result to be Lipschitz. Uh, we're starting with one Lipschitz maps and we want the result to be Lipschitz. And so what we'll do is we'll choose some co coefficients. We'll choose uh, coefficients a sub i, uh, which are square summable, and then define a f, which is the direct sum of a sub i, f sub i. Because our a sub i are square summable, this sum is going to be Lipschitz with Lipschitz constant on the, with, with Lipschitz constant given by the L2 norm of the a. Um, Furthermore, if I have two points q1 and q2 that are separated by about rho to the i, that are a distance roughly rho to the i apart, then they should be separated by the ith coordinate in this map. So the distance between f, f of q1 and f of q2, on one hand, because the function is Lipschitz, uh, is at most a constant times the distance between q1 and q2. But on the other hand, if we just look at the ith coordinate of this map, then the image in the ith coordinate of the map sends q1 and q2 at least distance c inverse a sub i distance between q1 and q2 apart. Uh, so, 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 so if I have two points that are separated by distance about rho to the i, then their images should be separated by about a sub i rho to the i. Uh, their images should be separate in the ith coordinate of this map. Um, and so in particular, at least in particular, we should be able to get a bound on the distortion by looking at the size of these coefficients. If we can make these coefficients large, uh, then we can get a map with low distortion. Uh, and so that's exactly what we do. Uh, if we want to construct a map 
from the, from, from, from the ball of radius r in the lattice to L2. We do this construction, we let rho equals two, and we choose a sub i to be uh, one over root log r when i is between zero and log two r, and then zero everywhere else. This has the property that the sum of the squares of these coefficients is order of one. So the map we get by summing a sub i f sub i is roughly one Lipschitz. But furthermore, if I have two points in the lattice, uh, if I have two distinct points in the lattice, then on one hand, they can't be too far apart. They have to be distance at most 2r from one another because they're both in the ball of radius r. And on the other hand, they can't be too close together. If I have two distinct points in the lattice, the closest they can be is that they can be distance one apart. So the distance between them is between one and 2r. And so in particular, the distance between them is comparable to rho sub i, or rho to the i, for some i between zero and log r. So that means that they're going to be separated by one of these summings. Uh, that means the distance between fq1 and fq2 is on one hand, it's less than some constant times the distance between q1 and q2 because the map is Lipschitz. On the other hand, uh, it's at least uh, distance between q1 and q2 over root log r because the, 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 the smallest coefficients in our map are, 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 are one over root log r. And so what we end up with is we end up with a map which has distortion on the order of root log r from the ball of radius r in the lattice in the Heisenberg group to L2. Is this okay so far? So this works for, for, to give us a map to L2. We can do the same sort of thing to get a map to LP. We just need to make some small changes. If we want to embed into LP, uh, then we can take the same scale factor, rho equals two, but we can increase the coefficients slightly. And before we had coefficients on the order of, uh, we had coefficients like root log r. Uh, if we're mapping to LP, then we can take coefficients with, uh, we, we can take coefficients of one over the pth root of log r. Uh, the reason for that is because the, 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 the because, because now when we take the direct sum, uh, the Lipschitz constant of the direct sum is going to be the LP norm of the Lipschitz constants of the pieces. And so these coefficients are, uh, have, 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 have bounded LP norm. And so the direct sum to LP that we get here is going to be, again, roughly one Lipschitz. Uh, we, have, we have the same argument that the distance between two different points in the ball of radius R in the lattice is between one and two R. Uh, but now, so, 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 so if I have two points in the lattice and they're separated by one of the coordinates of this map, but now each of the coordinates of this map is a little bit bigger because we're choosing our, con our, we're choosing our coefficients to be a little bit bigger. Uh, and so the, so, so, so the lower bound on the distance between FQ1 and FQ2 is a little bit bigger. And so the distortion of this map is a little bit less. It's, it is going to be uh, the pth root of log r rather than the square root. And so as p goes to infinity, we're getting better and better embeddings. And these are really roughly the best that we can do. Um, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a lower bound on distortion due to Lafort and Noor, uh, which shows that the LP distortion of the ball of radius r in the lattice is on the order of log r to the one over the, one, one over the maximum of p and two, when p is greater than one. Um, the significance of this exponent here is that this 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 is the uh, this is the exponent of the the modulus of uniform convexity of the Banach space LP? Uh, very very roughly speaking, one way to think about this is that um, the, the, the 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 modulus of uniform convexity is going to govern how bumpy a function, how bumpy a curve you can draw, and so it governs. Um, well, it bounds pictures like this. It bounds, um, it bounds how close to a line a Lipschitz curve in LP has to be. Anyway, um, so 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 yeah, so 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 this is so this is basically the picture for p greater than one. Remember, our whole picture looks like this. Uh, we, 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 we want to look at the distortion exponent of m sub r. And for p greater than 1, we have a curve like this. 
Uh, what's left to do is to look at what happens in L1, why there's this discontinuity uh, when you look at embeddings of this ball of radius R into L1. And so the first reason that there's this discontinuity is that the argument we used for L bigger than, or for P bigger than one um, just doesn't work anymore. Um, the argument we used for P bigger than one basically basically uses this idea that, 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 that if you have a map from, if you have a curve in LP, then it has to be differentiable almost everywhere. There have to be intervals on which that, cur that, that, that curve is close to a line. That's simply not true in L1. Uh, Lipschitz maps to L1 need not be differentiable anywhere. Uh, and the standard example is the map F, which sends the unit interval to L1 of the unit interval and sends f of t to the characteristic function of the interval from 0 to t. You can check that this is an isometric embedding, and the distance between f of s and f of t is s minus t. Uh, but it's an isometric embedding that can never be approximated by a linear map. It's not differentiable anywhere. And in fact, if you take any interval uh, in the domain, uh, the restriction of the map to that interval is never close to a linear function. It can never be approximated by a linear function. Uh, in fact, this is, and we, we, we talked about bumpy curves before, about curves that are, that, 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 that are never close to a linear function. This is an example of a bumpy curve. This is an example of a sort of infinitely bumpy curve because this is, this is never close to a linear function. So this at least opens the possibility that we can publish that, that, that this at least opens the possibility of constructing embeddings of the Heisenberg group into L1 that are that have less distortion than the, 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 the embeddings of the Heisenberg group into other Banach spaces. How can we realize that? How can, how, 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 how can we make that happen? So well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to construct a map from the Heisenberg group into L1 based on what are called cut metrics. Uh, so the idea of a cup metric is that if you have a measure on, if you have some space X and you have a measure on the power set of X, uh, then there's a map F from X to L1, so that the distance between F of X and F of Y is given by the measure, is the measure of the collection of sets uh, that contain either X or Y, but not both. That contain the, 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 the measure of the collection of sets that cut X and Y apart, that separate X and Y. Uh, this is called a cut metric, and the the one of the main features of these cut metrics is that if you have any map from X to L1, then there is a corresponding measure. If you have any map from X to L1, then there is a measure on the power set of X that satisfies this identity, so that the, so the, the distance between F of X and F of Y is the measure of the collection of sets that separate x and y. And what that means is that instead of looking at maps from the Heisenberg group to L1, we can analyze, we can, we can analyze this situation by considering subsets of the Heisenberg group, by describing subsets of the Heisenberg group. Uh, in particular, uh, if, if, if I want to construct a, say, a, 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 a left invariant map from the Heisenberg group into, uh, into L1, it's enough to consider uh, left invariant measures on the power set. Uh, and so that's exactly what I'm going to do. Uh, I'm going to define a collection of left invariant cut metrics uh, based on subsets of the Heisenberg group by letting, by saying that for a subset S of the Heisenberg group, I'm going to define a measure mu S, uh, which is the Haar measure on the orbit of S under translation, the collection of translates of this set S. Um, this, this corresponds to a map from the Heisenberg group to L1, uh, which induces the left invariant metric so that the distance between F of P and F of Q is the collection, is the measure of the set of, is the measure of the set of elements of H, the set of translates of this set S that contain one of those points, but not both of them. Um, and this, this, this construction, actually gives us some fairly reasonable maps from the Heisenberg group to L1. Uh, so for example, uh, let's, take, let's, take the let's take a simple example here. Uh, let's take our set to be the unit ball in the Heisenberg group. 
uh, and then try to understand what this map does to the Heisenberg group, what this map does to pairs of points in the Heisenberg group. So remember, what, remember how this works. If I have two points P and Q in the Heisenberg group, then the distance between F of P and F of Q is going to be the measure of the collection of balls that contain either P or Q, but not both. So in particular, uh, in particular, the distance between F of, F of P and F of Q is going to be bounded. It's going to be at, me, at most the total measure of the, 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 it's going to be at most two times the measure of the unit ball because there are uh, unit ball many balls that contain P. There are unit ball many, many, many balls that contain Q. Uh, the, 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 farthest part, the, 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 the farthest part that two points can be is that if all the balls that contain P are disjoint from Q and all the balls that contain Q are disjoint from P. So if P and Q are far apart, then they're mapped to distance roughly one apart in L1. If they are a little closer together, then they're going to be mapped a little closer together. Uh, so for example, if P and Q are close together like this, so their distance t apart. And let's take t to be horizontal here. So, so p and q are connected by a horizontal line of length t. Then the distance between f of p and f of q is, again, it's, a, it's, a, it's the measure of the collection of balls that contain p or q, but not both. And so those are going to be balls that all intersect uh, this line, this line segment of length t. And you can check that there, there are about t many of those balls. So the distance between f of p and f of q is going to be on the order of, 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 of t. And that's good in this case because the, the, the distance between p and q is on the order of t. So this is, this is roughly preserving this horizontal distance. The problem that we run into is vertical distances. Because if I have two points that are separated by a vertical segment of length t, then again, I'm looking at the distance between their images is going to be the measure of the collection of balls that contains one but not the other. Again, those are the balls that intersect this segment. There are going to be roughly t of those. Um, but the problem is that the distance between their images is going to be the, on the order of t. But the distance between the original points, because those points are separated vertically, the distance between those original points is going to be on the order of root t. And when t is small, this is going to be much larger than p. And so what we end up with is we end up with a map that embeds horizontal lines reasonably well. It preserves distances along horizontal lines that are smaller than one, but it collapses these vertical lines. Is this okay so far? Is this clear? Let me just check the, let me just take a look at the chat. Um, So is the cut measure required to be finitely or countably additive? Um, I, I, think this is, I, I, I think I want this to be a, me a measure. I think I want this to be countably additive. Um, but for, 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 for the purposes, we're, for, 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 for our purposes, for what we're doing, we're ultimately looking at map from finite sets into L1. And so if you, have a fine, if you start with a finite set, then the, uh, then, then, then the tower set is finite. So it doesn't matter whether you take finitely additive or countably additive. Um, um, I'm, we, I'm, can, I'm, we can do questions later. Okay. Yeah, don't worry about it. OK. Um, anyway, so, 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 we, so we end up with a map that, that, that embeds horizontal lines reasonably well, but it collapses the vertical line. And so, 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 so we can ask. How can we improve this? How can we get a map that doesn't collapse the vertical lines? Well, the natural thing, one thing you could do is instead of taking the unit ball, you could try to take a more complicated set. Say you have something like this. Um, then this is going to do a better job of separating vertically, ver vertically separated pairs, because if I have a, uh, a segment like this, then there are going to be a lot of ways, there are going to be a lot of translates of this set uh, where that segment crosses the boundary. So we can, we can try to get a map that separates vertical lines better by, by taking a more complicated set. But the problem with that is that ultimately we want our map to be Lipschitz. Uh, and in order to get a Lipschitz map, in order to bound the Lipschitz constant, we need to know that points that are separated horizontally uh, don't get sent too far apart. 
And the problem is that if I have a very complicated set like this, there are going to be a lot of translates of this set that cross this horizontal line, that cross this horizontal line segment. And so the Lipschitz constant, so, so what we end up seeing is that the Lipschitz constant of my map is going to be governed by the measure of the boundary of the set, whereas the, the degree to which it separates vertical points is going to have to do with how many vertical segments, how many vertical lines cross the boundary of the set. So if we want to improve this, if we want to get a, ma a map that doesn't collapse the vertical lines like this, we need a set that cuts as many vertical lines and as few horizontal lines as possible. And so how can we construct that? Well, let's try something. Let, 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 let's try this. So let's take, let's take here's, our, here's our unit ball. And then let's try to perturb this to make it separate, make it cut more vertical lines, but about the same number of horizontal lines. So I'm going to zoom in on just one piece of this. I'm just going to take uh, a piece of the side there where it's pretty smooth. And that's going to be some plane like this in the Heisenberg group. Um, and because of the way our, 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 our blue and red lines are set up, the blue lines go basically parallel along this plane. So if I want, so, 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 so hypothetically, if all the blue lines were exactly parallel, if we didn't have this tilting as you go from left to right, if all the blue lines were exactly parallel, then you could, you could perturb the set to cut more vertical lines and the same number of horizontal lines by just adding corrugation, by just saying, okay, we're going to take this and we're going to fold it back and forth like so, and we'll get, we'll, we'll fold it back and forth like so, and we'll get some surface which is just made up of horizontal lines like this, and I've drawn my perspective really badly here. Um, all I, all I want to do is I want to take this, uh, I, I want to take the, 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 the plane, and I just want to fold it back and forth like this so it looks like a, a zigzag like so. Um, but if we do that, then if we, do, if we do that, then we don't intersect any additional horizontal lines because all the red lines still cross through just transversely like so, and the blue lines either go parallel to the surface or they, they avoid the surface on one side or they avoid the surface on the other side. They don't cross the surface. So if all the blue lines were exactly parallel, we could just perturb our surface to be a corrugated sheet. But they're not. They, they, but they're not. I mean, if, they, if, 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 if I do this corrugated sheet like this, then the blue lines are going to start to tilt, and so they are going to intersect these corrugations. But we can still use this. Uh, we can still say this still gives us an idea, which is that the, a good way to perturb our surface is to try to perturb it along these blue lines. So we have these blue lines going from front to back like so. Uh, and we can add bumps to our surface that are stretched out, that are elongated along these blue, these blue lines. So we add a bump there, and a bump there, and a bump there. And these bumps are stretched out so that they intersect a lot of vertical lines, but hopefully the horizontal lines just pass from one side to the other. Um, this does pretty well for separating vertical pairs of points that are about this far apart. Uh, because if I, have a, if I have a pair of points that's about this far apart, then there's a good likelihood that one of them will be inside a bump and one of them will be outside the bump. But if I take points that are much closer together, then that, that it, it doesn't do so well. Because if I take points that are very close together, then it's pretty good odds that they'll both be inside the bump or they'll both be outside the bump. And so in order to fix that, we need to add another series of bumps. Uh, again, we want to add those bumps to be along those blue lines so that, they, so, so, so that the horizontal lines don't intersect too much. Uh, but we have to keep in mind that as we add these bumps, we're moving to different parts of the space, and so the horizontal lines start to tilt. Um, and the picture looks like this. Uh, so we start with a plane. We add one bump in the center. In the center of that bump, the x-coordinate is bigger than on the edges. And so in the center of that bump, it, the, 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 these curves start to tilt a little more. Um, and, so, and, and, and we have to take that into account when we have the next set of bumps. Uh, we have this next set of bumps along the lines from before. Um, and again, in the center of each of these new bumps, the slope is a little bit higher than around the edges. 
And we have to take that into account when we add the next set of bumps. Uh, so we add another set of bumps. Again, we, we, we follow the lines from the previous step. And as in the center of each of these bumps, so the, the, the slope is a little bit larger than around the edges. And so we can repeat this process again and again. And what we end up with is a surface which is very bumpy uh, and where a vertical line passes through many of these bumps, but a horizontal line tends to go along these curves, tends to go from one side of the bump to the other. And so what we end up with is a curve that cuts as many vertical lines and as few horizontal lines as possible. Uh, we can quantify this. It turns out that adding a layer of bumps of depth epsilon adds epsilon to the fourth to the perimeter of the set. And so if we want to separate all the points between distance one and distance two r, that's logarithmically many uh, scales. So we need logarithmically many layers of bumps. All those bumps are going to have about log r to the minus one fourth depth. And because we can get that much depth, we get an embedding with distortion on the order of uh, fourth root of log r. Uh, we, get, we, 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 we get an embedding that's, that, 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 that's better than what we can get in L2. And this is really, this is nearly optimal. Uh, Asaf and I proved a Poincaré inequality showing that if you have a set whose boundary cuts many vertical lines, then it has to have large measure. Um, I won't go through the inequality because we don't, we, we, because we're, we're, we're out of time. Um, but this is, this is where the, the lower bound on the distortion comes from. Um, and so, so let me just conclude. Um, the, if I had to sum this up in a couple sentences, what I would say is that um, when P is greater than one, when we're looking at the uniformly convex case, maps from the Heisenberg group to LP are governed by the differentiability, by the bumpiness of curves in LP, by the difficulty of constructing curves that are not close to lines anywhere. Uh, in the non-uniformly convex case, in the map to, to, from the Heisenberg group to L1, Maps from the Heisenberg group to L1 are governed by the behavior of surfaces in the Heisenberg group. And in particular, they're governed by how bumpy you can make surfaces in the Heisenberg group, how well you can do this construction. And in particular, this, this, this construction is entirely a product of the three-dimensional Heisenberg group. Even if we change the group slightly, if we take the five-dimensional Heisenberg group instead of the three-dimensional Heisenberg group, uh, surfaces behave much differently. And so you get distortion like root log r and a Poincaré inequality with an with a, with a, with a, with a exponent 2 rather than exponent 4. Um, and I don't know whether there's a way to, 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 to construct a space where this sort of argument works even better. But it's possible. Uh, and then just two open questions. One. As p increases to infinity, we know that our embeddings get better. Um, but as p approaches 1, we know that the asymptotic growth of our embedding stays the same. Morally, something should happen as p go, approaches 1. As p gets closer and closer to 1, these, these, these embeddings should get at least a little bit better. But it's unclear exactly what happens. And then one last question. This construction shows that you can construct sets where the set of where, where you can construct metric spaces where the set of LP spaces that they embed into is not connected. Uh, in, in, in this case, we're, we're constructing spaces where P of X is the union of the interval from Q to infinity and a point. But what else is possible? Can we can, can we can we can we do this with other uh, sets? So, okay, I'm out of time. Thanks. All right. Thank you so much, Robert. That was a fantastic talk. Um, if there are any questions, we can, we can take that now. If you want to ask a question, I think you need to unmute yourself instead of raise your hand. It works better. Hit your unmute button. Yeah, I don't think there are any questions right now. Well, it was too much to take, and maybe we need to uh, think about it a little bit <laughs> before we ask questions. Uh, any comments of any type? M.A. Sylvie has a question. He seems to have problems with his audio. He has oh, OK, I don't see that. Uh, 
if you're having trouble with uh, audio, you can just put in the chat, uh, write in the chat. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, we don't hear you, so uh, you have to <laughs> you have to unmute yourself. Okay, so um, I, I I can't hear you. I, I see. Yeah, so uh, I don't think. Yeah. Oh, all right. That's. Uh, All right then, uh, Robert. So I'm gonna end it here. So, I mean the the, the recording, but we, we we still we can still stay a few minutes after, and and people can still talk about it. Okay. Uh, so thanks so much again. So we really appreciate it. Sure. Thank you.